All right, everybody, shalom, and welcome to the Shai Fleischer Show, broadcasting live from Judea to the world. You're a part of it wherever you are. Where am I right now? I'm in the uh, Dagan neighborhood uh, of Efrat. I'm overlooking a very ancient uh, water um, canal system that was created in order to bring water to the Beit HaMikdash, to Jerusalem. And I'm overlooking it right now as part of guard duty. I'm not actually guarding. I'm on. Uh, I'm on rapid response. Um, what's it called? Like a like a response team, preparedness team. Meaning to say, I'm not actually on guard duty. I'm just standing around, not even in full battle gear, but yes, in uniform, in order to make sure that if something does happen, we are ready to respond. So we're we're we're, we're on on ready call, first responders, and um, the war keeps going. It's been uh, it's been now many months. And uh, it's three months plus. Hostages are still uh, held hostage. And we're still in this uh, situation. Um, at the same time, uh, there's, there's, you know, these, these battles and skirmishes. Uh, and uh, the day before yesterday, we had uh, 21, 21 Israeli soldiers killed in one day. That was a very, very dark day for Israel. And the day before that, three more. So about about in 24 hours, 24 soldiers uh, were killed. And there's a lot of questions right now about how we're fighting this battle. And once again, uh, you know, the question of of, um, of of fighting with our hands tied behind our back instead of uh, using artillery and missiles and air force to just you know uh, destroy houses and move the the folks, the the would-be terrorists south. And just making sure that they're, you know, not one of our soldiers gets hurt. Um, instead of that, uh, we are going house to house, and it's it's hard for me to understand what what the reason for that is. Um, I fear that it's because of a fear of um, of what the world will say. Um, but it is uh, it's really it's I don't like to talk in these terms, but it is heartbreaking to see uh to see that on the other hand uh you know our soldiers fighting in battle against the jihadis uh and uh, killing the hamas uh operatives and terrorists that's of course uh so so important and, and so heroic and beautiful at the same time like is this the right way to fight it that's those are question marks uh that uh, that still very much remain and, and are on top of mind here in israel and uh with that uh it's been raining very hard Last few days, I was on guard duty. It was just pouring. And now, uh, it's not. It's cloudy, uh, but the sun is breaking through as I'm standing outside here. And today is a special holiday. It is Israel's Arbor Day, uh, known as Tu Bishvat. Tu Bishvat. And Tu Bishvat is the um, beginning of the, let's call it the Jewish version of summer solstice. Like, this is the beginning of the summer season in the kind of broad sense that there's really only two seasons, which is summer and winter. Uh, so Tu Bishvat signals the beginning of the summer, and there's discussion about sap going into the trees. And um, and it's it's like there's two halves of the year. There's Tu Bishvat and Tu Be'av. And so um, we are today um, celebrating that, and usually it's a, it's a time for planting. And I guess we're going to have to plant a lot of uh, trees in the names of the soldiers and, and the victims that are, that have fallen, um, you know, Israel is really in the midst of a of, an, of a struggle right now for its identity, uh, for what it wants to, um, how you know how you fight the war is 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 all dependent on what your objectives of the war are, and your objectives of the war are dependent on your uh, vision of what Israel is. So, you know, if you think that Israel is a secular humanist a kind of state, uh, then you fight uh, in that, uh, supposedly, you know, and it's a Western state, then you fight, you know, in, in accordance with that vision. But if you fight uh, because you believe that Israel is a Middle East Jewish state with a temple at its heart, with Jerusalem uh, as the Jewish capital, then you fight with that in mind. And so that is really, that's really, I think... <clears throat> I think I said it very simply now. I think I kind of agree with myself that um, you could actually boil down to something very simple. You fight in accordance with what your vision of Israel is. That's really what it is. And we have different visions, competing visions. We have competing visions for what Israel 
Israel should be, where it's going, right? It depends on what, where you think it's going. We have very, very different visions. And um, we also see each other's visions as dangerous. If you know, I see the secular, humanist, Western-style Israel as... There are some things that I find it to be to buy, redeeming. There are redeeming values in that. But but I think it's dangerous because it uh, you know it, it secularizes the Jewish people and it and it makes us into also you know people who don't fight properly and and really don't have a vision of God in their heart. Uh, but for the secular folks, a vision of Israel as you know a, a Jewish state is scary to them. It's messianic. Oh my God, you got to start World War Three. That kind of stuff. So um, and and they themselves be like they're also afraid of uh, being forced you know, forced uh, into religion, religious coercion. So we have very different, uh, very different uh, visions, and those different visions lead you to a different way of fighting and uh, identifying the bad guy and fighting it, right? So that's the, uh, that's the situation that we find ourselves in today. And at the same time, today is a day of Tubishvat, of growth, of rebirth. Um, and I know a lot of you were moved by that song that I put last week uh, by Yehuda Becher, and and that uh, that that tune that he's saying finishes off with this uh, concept: "Blessed are you, God, who returns souls to dead bodies." <clears throat> and that's what Tubishvat is. Tubishvat is an element of Tchiat uh, uh, the resurrection of the dead, uh, because you know uh, winter was is like a you know there's like a passivity to to the world, and uh, and and now the sun's coming back out, and and we kind of come out of our shells. Uh, come out of our snail shells there. I just saw a snail shell, so it makes, made me say the word snail shell. Little tiny snail there. And um, there's tria. There's, there's, there's an awakening right now. Uh, I love Tu Bishvat very, very much uh, for that. And I, and, uh, and I want to remind everybody that we are supposed to pray for an etrog. Right now is when we pray for an etrog. And so we pray for a good etrog for the Sukkot holiday. So everybody take a second and pray for that good etrog for the Sukkot holiday. Uh, and what that really means is, right now we plant the seeds, and on and Sukkot we're going to be, be picking the fruits. So, like, let's have a vision. That's really what that means. It's like have a vision for that fertility. Have a vision for that fertility, Bezrat Hashem. Thank you, Hashem. I'm looking up at the clouds. Sometimes I see a sliver of blue amongst the clouds, and I just feel like that's the lattice work that Hashem, that God, is looking down upon us, and is and is smiling at us, winking at us, guiding us, uh, uh, bringing awe to us as well. Um, you know, to fear him, to to love him, and and to walk in his paths, and to and to follow him uh, more nearly, as we say. So um, let let's uh, let's talk about some uh, some other things that are on today's show. We have the first thing we have all of our uh, sponsors that, that that make our show possible. Uh, it's JewishPress.com and JNS.org, excellent news sites, and I really do recommend that you check it out. Hebron, HebronFund.org is my home. Uh, where uh, we get to uh, defend and, and beautify and build Hebron, the Jewish community of HebronFund.org, and of course HighOnTheHard.com. If you want to go to the Temple Mount, my mom was on the Temple Mount just this morning and sent me a picture of amazing ladies on the Temple Mount. It gives me a lot of strength uh, to see this group going up and uh, and uh, and and uh, making pilgrimage and homage to God uh, in the heart of Jerusalem. Again, that's the vision, right? Uh, and of course, our, our good friends at uh, at um, uh, at prohibitionpickle.co.il, uh, making yummy, yummy foods for me. Lots of pickled stuff, which is good for my gut, and it's holy, and it's pickled, and it's good for your innards. Making your innards holy as well. Prohibitionpickle.co.il, uh, and uh, that reminds me of buymeacoffee.com forward slash ishai, which also helps a lot. Uh, koshercycletours.com. Of course, I, I, I'm still I'm still waiting for that tour of kosher cycle tours. I'm waiting for that moment, that respite. Uh, and right now, my uh, my day my uh, daily driver watch is being fixed, and so I'm wearing my more fancy watch from uh, retrowatchguy.com. I'm wearing a fancier watch right now in the army. I hope it doesn't get hurt here, Bizarat Hashem. Um, we have also some great audios for you. First, um, um. Uh, I have a new uh, kind of new push on social media, and uh, it's on YouTube and it's on Instagram and and uh, you know my Twitter feed and all that kind of stuff. So we're pushing out their knowledge and information. Of course, the you know big tech tries to suppress it a little bit because they don't want too much 
you know, temple and Zionism to, to get out there. Uh, that being said, uh, I recently just found a video and we posted it that I made uh, speaking at a conference about kind of the future and the vision. And basically this talk, uh, which is about uh, 15 minutes long, is about um, how dumb the two-state solution is, why it doesn't work, and really alternatives to it. And people seem to like it, so I wanted to uh, post it here today uh, on the show. So here's me talking about four reasons why the two-state solution is a failure. Hi, everybody. My name is Ishai Fleischer. I'm the international spokesman for the Jewish community of Hebron. Hebron, that's where the mothers and the fathers of the Jewish people are buried. But they're not just the mothers and fathers of the Jewish people. They're really the mothers and fathers of ethical monotheism. Today in Oxford, you could go study something called the Abrahamic faiths. Uh, which means that everything comes through Abraham, and all of us, uh, uh, certainly Jews, Christians, and Muslims, can trace their their ideological uh, outlook on the world, their religion, their their, their philosophy to Abraham. And and he's uh, this great revolutionary and superstar. And we have the uh, we have I have the great honor of representing the interests of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob internationally. That's a lot of fun for me. Uh, today I want to talk a little bit about the end of the two-state solution and why the two-state solution was dead from the beginning. It was born, stillborn. It was stillborn, right from the onset. And uh, I want to start by telling you a little story that happened to me. You know, I work in Hebron, but strangely, I live on the Mount of Olives, okay? I live on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. I work in Hebron. I drive every day for about an hour. In the morning, I look out my window, I see the Temple Mount, In the afternoon, I look out my window and I see the tomb of the fathers and mothers in Hebron. It's a pretty good job, right? Uh, And a good life. uh, We should should realize how lucky we are in this generation to be living in a time when we can be in the land of Israel. And I live on the Mount of Olives. It's in a generally Arab neighborhood, neighborhood, not village, a neighborhood in Jerusalem, and it's called Ras El Amud. Ras El Amud. Now, uh, for years, I tried to shop in the Arab stores there, but basically, after a few years, I gave up. I tried to do it in, in order to encourage um, coexistence and those kind of feelings, but I, I found that they really didn't want me there, and they basically explained to me that, it, that they are victims of the jihad. If I come into their store, somebody else is looking at them, and they're judged, and they're saying, why are you letting this mustautan, this settler, come into your store? What, are you friendly with the settler? And so they don't want that. And so therefore, uh, uh, my Arab neighbors are actually quite fearful of being judged by their society around them. They are the greatest victims of the jihad. Anyway, I stopped shopping in their stores because I saw that I was actually endangering them. One time, though, I walked past one of these stores in Ras El Amud, and I see a poster, and the poster is of a fist smashing a Star of David. Now, I don't read Arabic. I speak a little bit, but I don't read Arabic. But I knew the store owner, and I just got so indignant, and I walked right into the store, and I said, Dode, Maze, what is this supposed to be? You, you live in our city. You, uh, you, you have the protection of our police. You have water running because of the state of Israel. This electricity comes from the state of Israel. What kind of thing is this? And you have next-door neighbor Jews. Right here, you're going to put a poster that shows uh, a fist smashing the state of Israel, the, the Star of David, what kind of thing is this? And I started making a ruckus, you know, because I was indignant. I was very upset at this, you know, type of swastika, let's put it, you know, something that's really calling for the destruction of my state. So he says to me, you Zionists, you Mustautin, you settlers, and he starts giving me the whole rant. Now, there was a few people in the store, and the f- people in the store all basically were like, okay, they scurried out of there. They don't want to, you know, deal with the rumble. They're not interested in the mess. They were out. The minute they were all out, he comes close to my face. I know this guy for a long time. Comes right up to me. He says to me, don't be stupid. <laughs> I said, what? what? <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? He said to me, look, this poster, why do you think I put it? He says, do you even know what this poster says? I said, no, I don't know what it says. It says, don't purchase Israeli products, boycott Israeli products. He said, Ishai, look at the poster. It says, boycott Israeli products. Now, come here. Look in my fridge. It's all tznuva, okay? Everybody knows I sell Israeli products. But I put this poster up as my insurance policy against those same jihadis. 
that exist in Ras al and in all of our neighborhood. And I have to show them that I'm cool with the jihad so that they don't torch my store. He says, this is my mezuzah. That was his little joke to me. And I was like, first thing I was like, uh, I obviously do not understand what's happening underneath here. And, he's, and that was the first part. That was the first part. He finishes right there and he says to me, you know, this is my protection policy against the other guys. But then he adds another point and he says to me, will your police protect me if this place gets torched? Will your insurance companies make sure I get reciprocity for what, what happened to me? No, you won't watch out for me. Your police will not watch out for me. And therefore, I have to use these ridiculous methods. Although it's a lie, and you could see that all the products are from Tnuva, from Israeli products. Okay? So that just lets you in a little bit into the psychology of what's going on in the streets. Now, the reason I wanted to start with the story is to say to you something that needs to be said and said so clearly. Everybody has to, if you have to get one point out of what I'm saying, this is it. I represent the settlers. I represent the right wing. I, like, I prefer to use the word nationalist, nationalist way of thinking. And you may think, and it has been said, and maybe the message is out there, that we, the right wing, the settlers, hate Arabs. And that our solutions, like our one-state solutions, oh, the various ones of them, mean somehow oppressing Arabs, means uh, taking away their liberties. I'm here to clarify to you that the right wing, the settler position, on a one-state solution means taking responsibility for the minorities living in our country. It actually means that Daoud would be protected from that kind of jihadist attack. And if indeed he got attacked, our police would make sure to protect him to, and, and the insurance companies would, would pay off uh, what he needs. We're here to take responsibility, not to pull our hands from responsibility. And that is a big and important statement. We're here to control this land, to be sovereigns in this land, and to make sure that our minorities that are going to be living inside, of course, granted that they're non-seditious, non-jihadist minorities, those that accept the rule of the state of Israel will be part of our sovereignty and will be protected, will be treated right. That's, so you got the caveat, okay? Right-wingers actually care about the people that we're sovereign over. Um, now, why are we settlers, quote-unquote? I'm using that term just so you all know what I'm talking about, right? Why are we uh, settlers here in this land? We're here in this land because we love it. Because we've waited to be here for 2,000 years. This is the very essence of our story. Our fathers and mothers are buried here. They've walked this land, and we want to walk it too. We, we, we are just so excited. You know, I know Ethiopian Jews, the old ones, uh, they told me that the old Ethiopians, when they used to die, they would die with the word Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, on their lips. That's how they would die. That's how they would give their soul back to God, by saying Jerusalem. We have always yearned to be here. So part of it is a love affair, a love of the Bible, a love of our history, uh, a love of spirituality, which is connected to this land. And that's the beautiful part. But here's another part. Another reason why we're here as settlers uh, in the quote-unquote West Bank is because we want to stop the two-state solution. That's right. We want to stop and have always wanted to stop the two-state solution. Not because, well, I hope that if the Arabs are nice, then somehow we'll give their, them the land and then we'll all leave. No, 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 no. I am against and have always been against the two-state solution. Why? I'm going to give you four quick points on why the two-state solution was stillborn, was a wrong thing from the get-go. All right? You got it? Four. Four points. You guys will keep track with me. Here we go. One, the two-state solution was incredibly ahistorical. Has anybody ever wondered this weird fact, why this fact uh, exists, which is how come Palestine wants to rise up exactly where the ancestral homeland of the Jewish people was. The Palestine that really of the two-state solution doesn't want to rise up in Tel Aviv. It wants to rise up exactly in the places of Hebron, Bethlehem, Jerusalem, Bethel, Shiloh, Shechem, Shechem, Nablus, exactly in those places that are the heart of our narrative and our story. That's exactly where Palestine wants to rise up. Is that a little weird? Maybe Palestine isn't really about a Palestinian state, but about the erasure of our historical narrative. That's number one. So therefore, if we went to a two-state solution, we were going to cut out our own history. 
on which much of the Zionism rests upon, the, the justification that we're, we're, we're from here. But if we're not from here and somebody else is there, like a Palestine, then we have no right to Tel Aviv. It has been said many times, if we have no right to live in Hebron, we have no right to live in Tel Aviv. That's point number one. Point number two was that the uh, uh, other side, the interlocutors, were never going to accept a small, tiny state. It never made sense. And if you listen to uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, it's a very paternalistic offer he's making. You have to recognize me only in these certain borders. I will have security here and here. You can't have an airport. You can't have a, a, a port, a seaport. And, of course, you have to be demilitarized. What kind of offer is that? If it's really their land, then get the hell off and don't tell me how to run it. If it's not their land, then why are you making that offer? It doesn't make any sense. But that paternalistic type of offer, like, you can have a state, but exactly like this and like this and like this, it was never going to fly. Nobody was going to accept it. It was never going to work. So first is that it was unjust and ahistorical. And the second one is that the other side was never really going to be satisfied with it. And third, which is very, very important, is that I'm going to say something that Western ears love to hear. Watch this. This is really important to me, and I'm willing to compromise on it for peace. I'm willing to give it away, although I love it, because I want peace with you. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? Doesn't that sound amazing? Like something that I cherish in my heart, I'm willing to give you. Doesn't that sound beautiful? But that's not the way it sounds in Middle Eastern ears. Because you don't compromise on certain things. You don't compromise on your wife, right? What we say, I'm willing to talk about Jerusalem because I'm willing to give it up for peace. Here's what the Middle Eastern ear hears. Here's my wife. Take her. Do whatever you want. Just don't, t- don't hurt me, right? I'm willing to do anything for peace. I'm, will- I'm scared. I'm willing to do anything. And the Middle Eastern ear hears, that guy's a jellyfish. That guy's spineless. I can't believe it. He just talked about Jerusalem. What's wrong with this guy that I'm talking with? He's, he's a broken person. He's lost all of his dignity, manhood. As, as all of his, he's willing to give up on the things that are most important to him. That means he's not a person. As they say in Yiddish, a nitkin mensch. He's not a person. So whenever you talked about two-state solution in the Western ear, it was like, that is beautiful. And the Middle Eastern ear is like, that guy is a loser, and we're going to crush him in time. Let's take what we can get now and keep going. That is why the two-state solution has always been shooting itself in the foot. It was always going to actually whet the appetite of the jihad because it says that other party, Israel, is weak. Lastly, and very importantly, the two-state solution... So far, are you with me? Okay. Lastly, the, third state, the two-state solution was number four... Uh, is simply an empirical failure. We have tested it. It is one of the best tested political solutions of all time. We have tested it in South Lebanon. We walked out and uh, we gave South Lebanon back to the Lebanese. We walked out of Sinai. We walked out of Judea and Samaria. And we walked out of Gaza. Every single one of those has turned into our cancer. Every single one of those has become a forward base of the jihad, including the much-loved Sinai Accords, which for a long time is what the left held on to as the, you know, the pinnacle of peace. Today, it's full of ISIS, and they're shooting rockets at us. You walk out of these places, you broadcast a message of fear, of weakness, and those very places have become the centers, the, the forward bases of the jihad, especially the last one, Gaza. Guys, people like myself were saying that if we walked out of Gaza, in a year it would be a terrorist state. And we were wrong. It took six months, okay? And it became one of the worst terrorist states that we're dealing with, and we have now fought three wars in seven years. Ouch. Bad move. And so uh, the two-state solution has uh, been an imp- empirical failure. So when somebody says to you, you know, let's keep going with the two-state solution, you have to ask him, like, <laughs> hasn't it been already debunked? The problem is, and here's the, 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 the kind of crux of what I'm trying to say, is that while what I'm saying makes kind of patently, patently uh, clear logic, it's very hard for a state, which can be likened to a... Uh, uh, aircraft carrier to turn around. It's very hard to say, oops, policy mistake, no biggie, let's back out of it, right? No biggie. Very hard for a state to do. It's also very hard to do because there's a lot of people who are making their money and their livelihood and their professorship or whatever in positions they've been saying two-state solution forever, like parrots, what are they going to do now? Oops, 
Everybody's fired. Don't worry about it. That PhD paper I wrote is meaningless. It was stupid. Sorry. You can't do it. It's not easy. It's not easy for people to pull out. But here's the ridiculous situation that happens. People like Prime Minister Netanyahu will get up there and say, I believe in a two-state solution. But it can't really happen right now. How does that sound? Does that sound hopeful? It sounds dumb. It sounds like you're either tap dancing around the issues or you're kind of like fudging it. You know, I, I want to give you a two-state, but it's not really going to happen because you're bad and we'll have to wait. In the meantime, I have a settlement policy. Europeans are telling us all the time, hey, guys, you can't have in a tiny little landmass a two-state solution and a settlement policy. Guess what? They're right. It's simple. It's a simple math. You can't have in a tiny little area a two-state solution and, and settlements growing all the time. And what we're doing by telling people that we want a two-state but not going for it and it's never really going to happen is frustration. Frustration for uh, the international community, which is like, when are you guys going to move it forward? But we're really not going to move it forward. Frustration for the Arabs. Well, are we going to two-state? Should I get used to a jihadist uh, uh, rule over me? Or am I going towards being a resident of Israel and maybe a citizen and live a decent life? Well, which one is it? I don't know what to hope for. We're causing tremendous frustration because we're not telling the truth. So here we go. I'm going to tell you the truth, folks. We plan on staying in Judea and Samaria. We plan on annexing Judea and Samaria. We plan on being sovereign in Judea and Samaria. And back to what I told you originally, we plan on taking responsibility over Jews, over Arabs, and other minorities in Judea and Samaria. That's where the future is. And the rest, it's not going to happen. Two states not going to happen. It's a lie. It's a failed experiment. We know, we know where it leads, and it leads nowhere. Um, I recently wrote an article in the New York Times outlining five uh, solutions, five alternative solutions, or really five solutions to, that are alternative to the two-state solution. Okay? Whenever they've told us for a long time now, for more than a quarter of a century, they've told us that the two-state solution is the only solution. You know, when somebody tells me something is the only, I'm just like, already I don't trust them, you know? you got to buy this car. This is the car. This is the only car for you. Well, there's another car out there, buddy. Don't sell me something. It is the only solution. Well, I can tell you what for sure. It's the only tested and failed solution. That's for sure. So people say to me after a talk like this, they say to me, okay, so what's your solution? And I say, everybody stop. Because the question that you just heard, that's the most important question. When somebody says to you, well, what's your solution? Is there an alternative to the two-state solution? Right there, we have reached a milestone. Thank God. Thank God that we came to a moment that we can actually think past that calcified and rotted old idea of the two-state solution. Just that very question, is there an alternative, will lead us to health, will lead us to, to, to new horizons and new, new opportunities. And that's what Talk 17 is about. It's really about saying, well, is there alternatives? There must be. There must be, because we're smart thinking people. We want a better future for all of us. Um, the question is more powerful than the answer, and the future is exciting. Israel is a great country. It's going to give great opportunities to people who choose to accept uh, the fact that it's a Jewish state and want to live under it. They will have every opportunity for upward mobility, for health, for education, for making a difference in this world. Those people who cannot accept a Jewish state uh, for one reason or another, they'll have to find their self-determination elsewhere. Israel is a tiny country in this region, and it has to remain strong, and it also has to embrace all the people that live w within it, of course, if they embrace us back. I want to thank you very much for your time. God bless you guys. And may we see new solutions and new alternatives come up soon. Thank you. All right, next up is, thank you very much, Yishai. Thank you for, uh, thank you for talking about uh, the, uh, the dumbness of the two-state solution. Giving away our land to our enemies is dumb, okay? <laughs> and again, it's about a vision of, what's your vision? What's your vision? What's your vision of Israel? That's the question of today's show, of, of Tu Bishvat. Let's just ask that. What's your vision? What's your vision of Israel? How do you see the future? That's really, that's really the question that we're asking today on this rebirth holiday, the rebirth holiday. What's your vision? So Ben Bresky, our intrepid reporter, is talking about Israel. The miracle, and sometimes the technological miracle, what could be more appropriate today than talking about irrigation of plants? How do we, how do we irrigate that land? And at the, at the cost of sounding like a drip, uh, let's talk about drip irrigation, which is an amazing 
simple way to to give the plants what they need not in one shot but drip 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 i know it sounds like it's like so simple but actually that idea that simplicity is rooted in israel see the pun there rooted in israel and here's our intrepid reporter ben bresky on the story of drip irrigation on today's arbor day of the jewish faith to bishvat ben bresky take it away This is a moment in Jewish history. The holiday of Tu Bishvat takes place this week, and it marks the New Year of the Trees. Israel has been a pioneer in planting trees, and studies show that Israel is one of the only nations in the world that entered the 21st century with more trees than it had 100 years ago. The Jewish Telegraphic Agency reported in 1949 that Tu Bishvat, which it refers to as Hamisha Asar Bishvat, was the first Arbor Day to be celebrated since the proclamation of Israeli statehood when the Israeli Constitute Assembly was scheduled to open. It was proclaimed as a forestation day. Members of the Israeli army, in cooperation with the Jewish National Fund, dedicated four new forests in memory of the Israeli troops who lost their lives in the recent fighting. An article from 1981 stated that the New York State Legislature marked Tu Bishvat, the Jewish New Year of the Trees, at a festive gathering attended by some 40 members of the Assembly and Senate, both Jewish and non-Jewish, and more than 100 guests from the local community. Assemblyman Sheldon Silver noted that the day had special significance in that it marked a new beginning for the 52 American hostages in Iran who were released and on their way home as the celebration was in progress. Tree planting started even before Israel became independent. An article from 1930 stated that the inauguration of Einstein Forest at Dilb, today in Kiryat Anavim, was planned by the Jewish National Fund to take place on Hamisha Asar Beshvat. The initial extent of the wood will be 10,000 trees. The German consul was among those to plant one of the first trees. One of the things that helped Israelis make the deforested and underdeveloped land bloom again is drip irrigation. Seen all over Israel, the thin pipes drip water to thirsty plants. Regulated by timers, they help irrigate crops in a region with little rainfall. The modern drippers were invented by Israeli engineer Simcha Blas and his son Yishayahu in the late 1950s. Born in Warsaw, Simcha Blas was a descendant of the revered rabbi the Vilna Gaon. On his mother's side, he was related to Rabbi Meir of Rothenburg, an important commentator on the Talmud from the 1200s. Jews had little rights in Germany at the time and were forbidden to leave. Rabbi Meir helped organize secret immigration from Germany to the land of Israel. He was arrested and imprisoned. According to tradition, a large ransom of silver marks was raised for him, but Rabbi Meir refused it for fear of encouraging the imprisonment of others. Simcha Blas was raised in the Gur Hasidic community and studied in Yeshiva before attending engineering school in Warsaw. As a Polish soldier, he took part in the Soviet-Polish War. In 1929, Blas moved to the land of Israel and lived on a kibbutz where he saw the problem of water shortages. He designed and installed advanced pumping stations throughout Israel. In 1937, the Mikorot Water Company was established by Jewish pioneers, and Blass was appointed chief engineer. In 1946, Blass planned the first water pipeline to the Negev, using pipes that had been used in London during the Blitz. The pipeline enabled the establishment of 11 new Jewish communities in the Negev, created in a single evening. It also brought water to Bedouin communities. Without the new Jewish communities, the Negev may not have been included in the United Nations map for the future state of Israel. According to the book Pollution in a Promised Land, an Environmental History of Israel, during the summer of 1946, the British imposed an 80-hour curfew on Tel Aviv and arrested scores of Zionist activists. Levi Eshkol, who by then was head of the Jewish Agency Settlement Division, sought a creative form of revenge. 
The night after Yom Kippur, he staged a lightning campaign, creating 11 new Negev communities on JNF lands. Blass was drafted to design the water delivery system. All the Mikarot team had to work with were tiny recycled six-inch pipes that had been used in London during World War II to help firefighters counter the bombing attacks during the Nazi Blitz. Now the pipes were to wind past Beersheba and irrigate the desert. The project was completed before either the British mandatory government or the area's Bedouin could interfere. Only weeks before the outbreak of the War of Independence, a pair of pipelines connected the northern Negev desert to the center of the country. During the War of Independence, Blass designed anti-tank grenade launchers. After the war, he organized and headed the Water Supply Department at the Ministry of Agriculture. In 1956, Simcha and Yishayahu Blass began development on the project he is best known for, drip irrigation. The father and son team developed a plastic emitter. Although primitive versions of drip irrigation already existed in some countries, the Blasses developed a method where instead of releasing water through tiny holes that can easily be blocked by tiny particles, water is released through larger and longer passageways using friction to slow water inside a plastic emitter. They created the prototype in Kibbutz Hatserim. It was one of the first kibbutzim to break with the traditional commune style of life and start a for-profit business, that being the Natifim Drip Irrigation Company. Kibbutz Hatserim is located in Israel's southern Negev region and gets its name from the Bible in Deuteronomy, where it is mentioned Hatserim, villages, farmyards as far as Gaza. The community was established in 1946 by a group of young scouts who were then joined by the Tehran children, Polish Jewish children, mainly orphans, who escaped Nazi German occupation and were evacuated with several hundred adults to Tehran, Iran, before being repatriated to the land of Israel. It was from this kibbutz that Natifim became a global enterprise. By the 1960s, they were supplying countries around the world with their innovation. In the 1970s, they developed pressure regulation for the drippers. In 2007, they created low-flow drippers and over the years have won international awards for sustainability and water management. Every year on Tu Bishvat, Israel celebrates its care for nature and the environment and the innovation of the people that helped Israel survive and thrive. This has been a moment in Jewish history. Thank you to Yishai Fleischer, Thank you to all the listeners, and Shalom. All right, Ben, thank you very much for uh, talking with me about drip irrigation. And uh, we are celebrating the rebirth and the resurrection, and that comes through drip irrigation. Can you believe that? <laughs> Did you know that the, the, the resurrection will come through drip irrigation? It doesn't exactly rhyme, but still, uh, I, think, I think the point is made. Uh, that uh, that today we celebrate the rebirth of the plants and rebirth of the Jewish people in the land of Israel. All right, so just one more uh, segment from the world out there. My good friend Jack brought to my attention, well, I saw this story. You guys saw the story about, uh, about David Tahar, whose son was killed in Gaza. But not only was he killed, but also he, well, it's hard for me to say it, but his head was severed from his body uh, by terrorists. Well, David Tahar wanted to bury his son. Not only, uh, not only did he want to bury his son um, properly, but he also wanted to bury his son fully. And he went on a, on a great effort in order to rescue and liberate the head of his son and bring it to proper burial. Uh, David Tahar was on CNN, and I thought to bring it to your attention so you can understand the story and what Israel is dealing with and the courage and the... Um, um, the, I don't know, the tenacity of the Jewish people to win and to be eternal um, and, to, and, to, um, and to make this land whole again. Here is David Tahar on CNN talking about his son. Israeli troops are now surrounding Gaza's second largest city, Khan Yunus, as Israel defense forces say they will continue their heavy fighting until they dismantle Hamas strongholds in the area. The main United Nations relief agency in Gaza says there are mass casualties after a shelter housing tens of thousands of displaced Palestinians was struck 
The IDF is investigating the strike and says it was not caused by Israeli artillery or aerial bombardment. Meantime, an Israeli official told CNN that any proposed deal between Israel and Hamas for a ceasefire has not reached to the negotiating table, but that indirect talks are ongoing. This as freed hostages are currently pleading with the lawmakers of the Israeli parliament or Knesset to do more to help free the remaining hostages. Here's Aviva Siegel. I became a mother to young girls there. I want to tell you that the terrorists bring inappropriate clothes, doll clothes. They have turned those girls into their dolls. Dolls on a string that they can do whatever they want with whenever they want. It's unbelievable that they are still there. I can't imagine what they are feeling. I can't live with it. Four months after October 7th, more accounts of Hamas's brutal tactics and the atrocities committed by Hamas terrorists on that day are coming to light. I recently spoke with David Tahar, whose son, 19-year-old Adir, an IDF soldier, was killed on October 7th. I want to warn our viewers that the details of his son's story are very disturbing. And joining me now is David Tahar, the father of 19-year-old Corporal Adir Tahar, an IDF soldier who was killed on October 7th. Uh, Mr. Tahar, it's tragic enough to lose a child, um, but explain how the details of his death were made worse as you learned more about what happened to your son. I can tell you that from an army investigation that was sent to us, the bereaved parents, the fighting that Adir and his friends did, it took about an hour, an hour and 20 minutes. While they were fighting, they managed to stop the terrorists. While they were fighting, five soldiers got killed, including Adir. I can tell you, I am certain that Adir, in order to kill Adir, they had to throw three grenades at him and then send a missile towards him as well. And only that way they could actually kill Adir. And after he died, the terrorist, the terrorists, they managed to enter the area. Some of the soldiers managed to retreat. The barbarian terrorists who entered the base, that area, they saw a soldier lying on the ground. What they decided to do at that moment, they decided to behead him and to take the head with them into Gaza. Now, this might be hard for some people to understand, but you went searching. You watched hours of videos from that day, and eventually you found the video to confirm your fears about Adir. Tell us about that. I can tell you that after the Shiva ended, the mourning period, I understood that I buried a headless child after the Shiva. Questions started to pop up. Where was the head? Is it because of the grenade or because of a missile? It didn't make sense to me that it would be anything else. I started asking why the head was not there. And I understood that he had been beheaded. That's how they managed to sever the head from the body. I started looking at Telegram. During the first month, especially in the first days of the war, the terrorists, the barbarian terrorists, posted online all the atrocities that they carried out. I just logged on to Telegram and watched every video I could find so I could maybe see my son in, in one of those videos. And I happened to find this video where I could see my son. I can clearly say that the soldier without a head that you can see in that video, 
שהראש מונח לידו, זה בעצם הבן שלי. And then you heard more from the army. Tell us about that. I, I can tell you that for two months, I turned to everyone I could in order to understand where the head was, to understand who picked the body, who handled it. And I understood that it was a certain unit in the Shura camp. I called them to ask, is it possible that by mistake the head is with them? Uh, they said no. And then one of the commanders called me, who did an investigation, carried out an investigation, and told me that it's most likely that the horrible terrorist took the head to Gaza. And that's how I understood that the head is not there. Two or three weeks after that, I found from another commander that the Shin Bet interrogated prisoners, terrorists that were kidnapped in Gaza, arrested in Gaza. And while they were interrogating them, they understood that one of the terrorists said that he tried to sell the head, a soldier's head, that he has. That happened while he was interrogated. It was found out that they put the head in a black bag. They went to Palestine Square in central Gaza. They put it in an ice cream fridge inside a shop. That's where they hid it in order to demand what, what they were promised, $10,000, when they bring a proof that they murdered a citizen or a soldier. And you got it back? Yes, an elite unit, an, an elite IDF unit brought it back. They took the terrorist. They were afraid that the bag was wired. They took him into the shop and they brought the bag. And inside the bag, there were Adil's head, his remains the remains of the head, and when they checked the teeth and th when they tested the DNA, it was proven that it was actually a deer. And I got all these remains with a bag. I got that from the idea for Abanite. We opened a deer's coffin and we buried him again. I'm so sorry, David. I'm so sorry that this happened to you. What a horrible, horrible, horrible experience. It really is. It's very difficult. But it's important that the world understands what we're facing. It's important that people understand that what happened on the 7th of October it can't happen again, not to Israel, the Israeli people, and not to anyone else. David Tahar, may Adir's memory be a blessing. I'm so sorry that you and your family have gone through that. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you very much, Mr. Tefer. Thank you very much. A spokesman for the Israel Defense Forces confirmed all of the details in David's story, uh, except for the $10,000 bounty, which they could not confirm. All right, folks, that was David Tahar on CNN, and, uh, and uh, we will endeavor uh, to, uh, to, to, to put it all together, to put it all together and to keep our, uh, uh, to, to keep our, to keep our to be to have a rosh to ro we have a rosh hashanah we have a, a, a today Tu Bishvat is a new year uh, of the plants but it's also a head and uh, we'll, we should have a rosh chodesh a new month a new head a new mind and 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 that and you know in a sense they say that one of the Amalek what it does is that it decapitates our thoughts disconnects our thoughts our mind from our heart. And I feel like that's a lot of ways that we have today. We have a detached mind and heart. Our heart is, is Jewish, but our mind is filled with all kinds of 
um, Ford influences, and we have to we have to put it together. We have to put it together, and I hope you understand what what, what I'm saying. And may Hashem bring His presence back into our land. He is he he is he is the thing that we are detached from, and we have a chance to bring it back together. Bezrat Hashem. All right, folks. Uh, final thoughts for today's show is about the Torah portion. The Torah portion is Beshalach. And this is the Torah portion that, like, this one, if you had to read one Torah portion in the book of Exodus, it's this one, okay? It's got everything. It's got the leaving of the Jewish people, exodusing the act of uh, from, from Egypt. And Moses takes the bones of Joseph with him. So, like, it's an, it's an inclusio. We're finishing up the whole thing. We're taking the bones of Joseph. That's like the last touch. He's the first in, last out. First in, last out. Maybe, we'll, maybe that's the, what I'll call the show today. First in, last out. Uh, and he takes the bones of Joseph with him. Uh, and they leave, and they, they exodus, and that's when we also learn about, about the matzah, and the matzah's made, <coughs> which is this, like, bread of data. That's what I call it. It's like a data bread. Because it contains with, within it this like knowledge <clears throat> of what the Jewish people are, how we left Egypt, how we're anti-slavery, and that's what the essence of the Jewish people is, how we're pro-anti-slavery, pro-servitude to God. Um, and then there is the, um, the, um, the Song of the Sea, the Song of the Sea. Right, and the song of the sea again is about vision. At the end, it's a vision of coming out of slavery and into the land of Israel and building that temple. That's what the song of the sea really is about. So Moses, you know, and the people sing the song of the sea. The women come out; they sing the song of the sea. This Torah portion is so full of all this light. And amazingly, at the very end of the Torah portion, Amalek comes out. the The Amalekites come out. They see the light, and they want to extinguish it. They see the light and they want to extinguish it. That's what they're about. They're about extinguishing the light. And they attack the Jewish people. And they darken, you know, the mood. But then, then Moses sits on, over at, at a cliff. His hands are held up by Aaron and Hur. And as his hands are held up, the Jewish people see him. They see the faith. They see the, that bridge between, between heaven and earth. And instead of having that detachment... Instead of that decapitating uh, uh, impulse of that's what Amalek wants to do. It wants to detach us from our Father in heaven. It wants to detach heaven from earth. It wants heaven to be just in heaven and earth to be the dark earth that they control. That, that, that impulse is bridged by Moshe Rabbeinu, <clears throat> who stands, who sits, uh, on the earth, but his hands are towards heaven over a cliff, and as they see him, they understand that there is a bridge between heaven and earth, and that it's not decapitated, it's not detached, it's one. And Moses is the channel for God's blessings into this world. He's, he's the bridge, and the Jewish people see him, and they are able to weaken Amalek, but not fully destroyed because the time hasn't come. You can't destroy Amalek until you come to the land of Israel. That's what the Torah tells us. And so uh, the war with Amalek continues until the end of time. And um, we have here, uh, we have amazing phrases. First thing, we're at their sea. It says, it says, Hashem yilachem lachem v'atem tacharishun. God will fight for you and you'll be silent because this is God's fight. And then the splitting of the Red Sea, the splitting of the sea, the splitting of the sea is, uh, is, is the birth canal. The Jewish people are on one side and they come out, they're like inside the womb in Egypt and they come out born into freedom, into the Sinai. And then they're going to receive the Torah and from the Torah they're going to go to the land of Israel. Um, so there's that. In the de- desert they get the manna bread. God is feeding them, right? God is feeding his child. Uh, in the desert, <clears throat> a nation that's born but still being raised in the desert is being fed. And then finally, uh, the fight with Amalek, and it says like this, it says, Moshe kvedim, The hands of Moses were heavy. Evan, they took a rock. Tachtav, they put it under him. He sat on it. And Aaron and Chur are holding onto his hands. From this side and from that side. 
His hands were faith. Ad <clears throat> until the sun came. Veichlos Yoshua et Amalek et Amol Fichar of Joshua was able to weaken Amalek uh, by the sword. And then at the end, the Torah portion finishes with this incredible, these incredible verses. God says to to Moses, you know, put it in a memory book, and put it in the ears of Joshua that I will I will destroy the the memory of Amalek from under underneath the heavens. <clears throat> and then Moses built an altar, Veikrashmo Adonai Nisi, and he called the altar, God is my banner. God is my miracle, God is my banner. Vayomer, and then Moses said, Ki yad, yad al kes ya, milchamal Adonai ba'amalek midor do. Because there's a hand on the seat of God. Some, some, some explanations mean that God puts his hand up in an oath. And others say, no, there's a hand that tries to rock the seat of God. I like that one a little better. Milchama. There's a war of God in, with Amalek from generation to generation. That is where we're living today, friends. We are living in that war of darkness versus light. And, and don't, don't, don't even think for a second that that's not where we are. We are fighting with Amalek. Amalek is, Amalek is not just Hamas. It's, it's a forces of darkness that want to suppress the Jewish people and want to, want to decapitate between heaven and earth and between the Jewish people and God and between this world of light and a world of darkness. They want this lower world to continue to be a world of darkness and, so, and that the Shefa, the plenty, the, the, the blessings will be cut off. We won't let them. We will unite, reunite, resurrect, rebirth. And that's my blessing to you, wherever you are, that in your uh, life, whatever it is, that you will feel today in Tu Bishvat a resurrection and a rebirth, and that Hashem's light will be in your life, and that you will feel that strength. Come into Shabbat, take a deep breath, mourn the losses, light a candle, and then say, Hashem, you are resurrecting us. You are giving us rebirth. We will not be cowed and we will not be darkened. We will not be decapitated. We will, we will connect heaven and earth. We will see Moses' hands up in our life. You won't believe this, but as I'm standing here, I see a big mountain right next to me and there's like a cliff there. And in my mind's eye, I could see Moses with sitting with Aaron and Hur holding his hands up and he is channeling that blessing between heaven and earth. He will not allow it to be cut off as Amalek would like it to be cut off. We will not let them. I want to bless you wherever you are. Stay tuned, stay strong, stay connected. Write me an email, yishaiyishaifleischer.com. Support a project, support Building Israel, yishaiyishaifleischer.com, hebronfund.org, and, and all the good folks. Support us, be part of it, build it, feel it, pray for it, and, and, and don't for one second succumb to those energies of Amalek. I also want to thank Moshe, Moshe Herman, Yochevet Seidman, Tabitha, Lou when we're live, Ben Bresky, David for helping push out hard on our social media. God bless you folks wherever you are. Stay tuned, stay strong, stay connected. Blessings and Shalom. <laughs>